Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Hi, and welcome to The Long View. I'm Christine Benz, Director of Personal Finance for Morningstar. And I'm Jeff Patak, Chief Ratings Officer for Morningstar Research Services. Our guest on the podcast today is author and financial educator, Manisha Takor. Manisha is founder of Money Zen, a financial education consultancy. She's also the co-author of two books with Sharon Kedar, On My Own Two Feet, published in 2007 and was updated in 2013, and Get Financially Naked came out in 2009. Prior to founding Money Zen, Manisha was Vice President of Financial Wellbeing at Brighton Jones. Before that, she was Director of Wealth Strategies for Women at Buckingham Strategic Wealth. Earlier in her career, Manisha held positions at several investment management firms, including Fayez Seraphim, Sands Capital Management, and Atalanta Sosnov Capital. Manisha is a chartered financial analyst and a certified financial planner. She received her bachelor's degree in American Studies from Wellesley College and her MBA from Harvard Business School. Manisha, welcome to The Long View. Well, Christine, thank you so much for having me. I wanted to start by talking about women and money. You've made educating and helping women improve their financial positions a key priority throughout your career. What are the key reasons that women tend to be less financially well than men? You know, for the longest time, we've cited three reasons, um, and I'll just cover them briefly. We spend more time out of the paid workforce caring for children and elderly parents, and we live longer. So we have less money coming in, and yet we need it to last more years. But the biggest reason I'm starting to realize as we go further is women, we don't invest in ourselves in terms of our knowledge about investing. And as a result, it's not just a wage gap we have, we have a wealth gap. And, you know, depending on which data point you want to look at across women as a whole, we have roughly 34 cents in wealth for every dollar that men have. And it's much worse if we parse that um, by ethnicity and, and other demographics. I wanted to talk about one of those three reasons that you cited, which is women's caregiving responsibilities, which reduce their lifetime incomes, as you already referenced. That's a complicated problem, obviously, that's deeply intertwined with cultural forces. In what ways do you think we can address it? Well, I mean, as we talk right now, Jeff, um, I am speaking to you, which is why our audio isn't as good as it would have been from my parents' home. They're in their 80s, and my dad was rushed to the ICU. And, you know, luckily, I'm far enough along in my career that I have complete flexibility and I can move. But, you know, most people don't have that. And so what I am hoping has come out of the pandemic, if there's any lasting silver lining from all of the chaos, it's that employers increasingly can see that flexibility can work. Um, And so what I'm hoping is that employers will be open to more out-of-the-box solutions to help women and men deal with elder care issues. Well, you referenced the pandemic, Manisha. The pandemic-related economic downturn has been called a she session because of its disproportionate impact on women. Many women have reduced their hours or quit paid work altogether to help care for children and supervise education at home. Do you think there will be lasting effects from this or will it be fleeting and and perhaps even an opportunity for things to get better for women? Well, I think it's going to be both. Um, One of the things that you see when women leave the workforce voluntarily or are forced to because of family obligations or their own personal health issues is that when they return, they return to typically lower salaries and lower positions than they had before if it's an extended time away. Men, that tends not to be quite so much the case. And the problem is compounding. When you come back to a job that's three, five thousand, ten thousand dollars less, depending on where you were in your career, and you're saving 10, 15, 20 percent of your income, and then you compound that over time, you know, that starting point really makes a difference. 
So I worry very much from that standpoint. That was an issue that's pre-pandemic. That's always been an issue, particularly with women taking time out and peak earning years to have children. My hope, once again, is that the pandemic will encourage employers to really think about productivity and output as opposed to FaceTime and geography. And if they do focus on that, um, you know, there's the old saying, if you want to get more work done, give it to the busiest person you know. And women are masters, um, has been my observation, particularly mothers, (laughs) at juggling a lot of balls and getting a lot of things done really well. How would you urge women to examine the financial dimensions of the decisions about whether to reduce hours or quit paid work altogether? Do you think it's possible that women perhaps think too much about whether the family can afford that choice in the present, but not enough about the long-term implications of it? You know what I've observed, Jeff, is oftentimes what happens is many times women try and work through it. They try to stay working. And oftentimes through their first child, they can. And then the lack of support from employers, I've noticed tens with child, depending on your level, child two or or three, just push you over the edge. And so I want to emphasize that women who want to stay in the workforce are having trouble. Another completely reasonable option is decide that you want to be home for those vital early years. I mean, study after study shows how important early childhood education and nurturing is on long-term health and well-being for all of us humans. And I think your point, Jeff, is a very poignant one, which is that when you're trying to weigh the future consequences, um, even if you do add that into the equation against a life that you love, how do you value that? And so, yes, I do think oftentimes women, particularly of younger childbearing years, predominantly focus on do we have enough money as a household to make it through this period rather than what is the impact this is going to have over my compounded you know, or aggregate earnings over the long run. But I I think it's compounded by the fact that the, you know, what we're comparing it to is quite literally unpriceable. You referenced the investment piece of all of this earlier. When I've looked at the data on how women invest relative to men, it appears that once you control for incomes, women do invest pretty similarly to men in terms of their investment allocations, how willing they are to invest in stocks and so forth. So do you think that the women are more conservative narrative is overdone or maybe oversimplified at least? I think it's oversimplified. Um, I had the honor and pleasure of working with Larry Swedro when I was at Buckingham Asset Management. And Larry had a framework that I just thought was brilliant. He said, you know, risk tolerance really has three components. It's willingness, ability, and need to take risks. And all too often, we focus on the first component, your willingness to take risk. And this, you know, if the market goes down, X, how would you feel? Which is a ridiculous question because most people would feel crappy when the market goes down. Um, But the second question, what is your ability to take risk? Oftentimes, women have an intuitive sense of this. And it's not, I, I don't think women are getting enough credit for this. So, for example... If you ask an entrepreneur, what is your risk tolerance? Well, it's high. They're an entrepreneur. But what is the steadiness of their cash flow? Not high, lumpy, (laughs) and therefore um, their business is risky. So perhaps their investments should not be. And in reverse, you know, you've got a tenured professor. Um, My mom was a professor. So I, I mean this in the most loving of ways that professors oftentimes, especially those with tenure, can feel a little bit more conservative than an entrepreneur, yet they can take on more risk. Um, and then the last piece, what is your need to take risk? I see this particularly with higher net worth individuals where the risk you took to get where you are 
you no longer need in order to maintain the standard of living that you want, not oftentimes just for your own lives, but in a, in a legacy standpoint. And so what I see with women is heightened risk awareness of those second two elements. And it may not be that crisply defined in their heads, but that's what I'm sensing in their guts. And then the final overlay I would have um, that I would point out is that I have observed qualitatively, I've not seen any quantitative data on this, that women are much more interested in cash flow, which is incredibly logical. We talk about the need for emergency funds and so forth, but I feel like if the industry um, and advisors in particular, if we were very clear with where funds are going to be coming from if there's a three to five year decline in the market that we've got not just an emergency fund but we've got you know a laddered portfolio for at least a portion of our fixed income allocation then what happens is you can take more risk on the equity side because you know you're going to be okay and you know you're not going to have a need to sell funds in a downturn. And I think those are the pieces that women inherently are sensing. And I don't think we as an industry are focusing enough on that in our dialogue with clients. I'm not saying we don't think about it with our advisor hats on, but there's a disconnect between that dialogue and the end client, particularly if the end client is a woman. Given that, do you think there's a continuing need for women-oriented financial education or advisory services? For instance, Elvest, which is um, an RIA that's oriented towards female investors to RIAs that are hosting women and wealth events for their clients and prospects. And if so, how can these firms best serve their female clients? What sorts of issues should they emphasize and in which should they de-emphasize? You know, it's interesting, Jeff. Um, Again, when I was at, um, well, I'll just say at a large multi-billion dollar unnamed um, wealth RIA, I was asked to lead up a women in wealth initiative. And I was actually really surprised. The younger generation was actually kind of punchy with me. Like, you know, a dollar is a dollar. It doesn't know, you know, what my gender is. Why are you treating me any differently? You know, the financial advice, would it be any different for me? And, you know, with the exception of the importance of needing to start saving earlier and more aggressively in terms of dollar amount, if you plan to take time out of the workforce to care for children, I really don't feel that there is that much that's different between advice that I would give at any stage in life to a man versus a woman. But what I've noticed once, you know, and that's the kind of the early 20s set that I was feeling that from, what I've noticed is as women spend more time in the workforce and just in life in general, they start often to find that when they are around the industry as a whole, there's a lot of testosterone-esque language. You know, we're crushing at the competitors. We're going to beat the market. We're going to dominate returns. Well, you know, I have a Harvard MBA, a CFA, and a CFP, and that doesn't resonate with me. So it's, you know, it has nothing to do with intellect or training. It's just um stylistically and the other thing that i have noticed is you know i like to say if you have one piece of rotten apple in a fruit salad it kind of ruins the whole thing and i don't mean to equate men with rotten pieces of fruit in a salad but what i've noticed is when you are in a group of all women there is a certain kind of dialogue that happens and if you bring in just one male the, the whole tone will change. And, and I'll give you this an example. I don't mean this in kind of a pink it and shrink it or demeaning way. I've done it. I can remember Dimensional um, Fund Advisors is doing some wonderful work around women and wealth. And I can remember um, I was part of the inaugural group and we came to um, the headquarters in Austin and it was amazing. And We had a day and a half of of workshops and brainstorming, and it was only women in the room. And we were on fire. And then for the final session, 
two men who are so pro women joined and I noticed halfway through I was using my little girl voice not my big girl voice and I you know I pointed that out and the other women acknowledged like yeah you do sound different and I feel like if it can happen to me and I've spent my whole career pretty much thinking about this topic um I can't be alone and so that's why I feel like there's still a need and it's not a demeaning need it's more of a comfort, a community, a worldview. And then the last thing I'll say on this is, you know, I've been in the business for 25 years and I spent the first half on the institutional side and the second half on the individual side. And I literally can't remember the last time I spoke to a group of all men prior to five years ago where a man asked me about ESG, socially responsible investing, MRI, pick your name. I can't remember ever over the last 25 years speaking to a group of women about investing where that was not asked about. And so that speaks to just kind of a different lens on the use of, purpose of, meaning for for money. So this is a very long-winded way of saying, yes, I think it's still a need And I still think it's filling a very useful purpose. And I'm going to take a break, see if you have any questions before I tell you whether or not I think it's working and what needs to happen. Let's talk about that, whether you think it's working. No, I don't think it's working. Um, And the reason I don't think it's working is it's still a very male-dominated industry. And what I have found personally when it comes to these programs is they are very poorly funded, and there is no acknowledgement that the sales cycle for women, and I hate to use that term, but in the industry, um, for advisors, you know, let's let's be blunt, that's what it is. It's a sales cycle. Uh, the sales cycle for women is much slower. But the flip side is, statistically, there's plenty of research that show women are more loyal clients and they refer more than men but it takes a lot longer for them to trust. And that's for all the reasons I've mentioned earlier. And so what I see happening is these women in wealth initiatives get started off with a bang. And then when there's not an immediate increase in assets under management as a result of these programs, by the next year, the budget's you know cut in half or more. And then two to three years into the program, unless you have a very powerful internal sponsor, male or female, the programs often go by the wayside. I wanted to switch over to discuss young people and financial wellness. Helping young people get off to a healthy start financially is another issue that you focused on in your career. Is the trading frenzy and so-called meme stocks, cryptocurrency, and NFTs concerning to you, or do you think it's a healthy, low-stakes experimentation that could help young investors become better investors down the line? I think it's an absolute horror. I think it's like um, feeding your child nothing but Twinkies and Pop-Tarts for five years. And the reason I say this is I, I feel like this is junk personal finance, the core of personal finance that young people need to learn, whether it's college or their 20s into their early 30s, basically revolves around making sure that you're living within your means, making sure that you are saving enough for the future. And I'll come back to the investment piece of how you invest that money protecting yourself, whether it's, you know, as simple as having the appropriate renter and car insurance, or if you're getting married, having the awkward money talk prior to getting married to make sure that you're financially compatible. And I feel like these are the core skills. And then if you have debt, which so many young people are dealing with student loan debt right now. I mean, many young people are graduating with a mortgage. That's how large their student loan debt is. And so, you know, understanding where buying a house fits into that picture, because it's very different than the picture their parents faced when they were their age. And so by focusing on these, you know, 
we can call them risky, esoteric. Some people may say cutting edge. I mean, I feel like if that's 5% of your investments, great. But 95% of that hard-earned money that you are living within your means, which is no easy thing to do, particularly on either coast, um, really should be invested in a manner that I would argue is more tried and true. And, you know, a while back, I had penned a short piece for the Wall Street Journal's uh, wealth panel experts online. And they were asking, what is the worst piece of advice parents can give their kids? And I said, um, telling them to invest in the stock of a company they know about. And oh, my God, did I get slings and arrows for saying that? And so I just think there's this widespread belief that you are putting your young adult child on the path to financial success by encouraging them to invest when investing, of course, is incredibly important, but it has to be done in the context of your total financial life and the other pieces are missing. So you're basically doing the financial equivalent and again in my opinion of eating pop tarts and twinkies and no one's talking to you about nutrient dense fruits vegetables high quality fish and meat etc buying a home is a big financial goal for many younger people how would you suggest they proceed in the current environment where interest rates are very low but home prices are high and, and inventory is low very very carefully I think there's this misnomer that we really need to change, and this can be one area where financial professionals can be of great help, um, which is this notion that owning your own home is the American dream. It was for our parents, and a big part of the reason for that is they took out 30-year mortgages in a time period where that payment was steady, um, home equity lines of credit and HELOCs were a very rare entity, and they had this steady payment that they were making over that 30-year period, and 10 to 15 years of that period was crazy high inflation. So they were getting you know, really nice annual increases in their incomes and salaries, but their home price payments stayed the same. And they lived in that house for a good 30 years. So they were heading into retirement with an asset that was completely paid off and again, turbocharged by you know the rising salaries in nominal terms relative to the debt payments. Today, I mean, buying and selling a home costs roughly 10% by the time you factor in you know, all the different expenses. And so the question is, if you are a young person today where mobility is the name of the game, and if you're at the same place for longer than five years, it's no longer considered a badge of honor. People might ask, you know, are you not motivated? And so, you know, you buy a home, but your dream job may pop up any time across the country. And then with women increasingly becoming co-breadwinners and primary breadwinners, now you have two careers to think about. And so I feel like the mobility of the modern era has not kept up or the notion of the home being the greatest source of wealth for most people has not kept up with the reality of the number of jobs, locations, and homes people will have going forward. So I'm not anti-buying a home, but I encourage people not to buy a home until they can put 20% down, until they have a solid six-month emergency fund, and until they reasonably think that they're going to be in that home for five to seven years. So, you know, they have reasonable odds of offsetting the price of selling the home with house price appreciation. And on top of all of that, making sure, especially if you have student loans, that your total all-in housing costs is not more than a third of your take-home pay. And when you stir all of that up, you know, maybe you need to rent a little bit longer and there's nothing wrong with that. It's not throwing money out the window. I think we need to disabuse that notion. It's giving you an option on the most important asset that you have at a young stage, which is your income stream, future income stream. 
you referenced this multitasking that goes on for young people where they're balancing all of these competing financial goals like college debt pay down, retirement savings, emergency funding, and perhaps home purchases and other short and intermediate term goals that they might have. So is there any sort of framework that you encourage young people to use when thinking about how to approach these multiple things that are bidding for those first paychecks? Yeah. um, You know, Elizabeth Warren wrote a book, I believe it was in 1992-ish with her daughter called All Your Worth. And in it, she talked about the 50-30-20 rule, which is now quoted everywhere. But me, whenever I present it, I'm amazed at how many people are like, whoa, wow, how powerful. And that's the message that I'd like to get across to younger folks is that in an ideal world for all of this to work, no more than 50% of your take-home pay can go to needs if you're going to set aside 20% of your income to invest for the future. And that leaves you with 30% wants. And all of us have a pie that is 100. And if you think that 20% number is insane, um, I saw a stat today, have not fact-checked it, but that a child today, born today, has a 50-50 chance of living to 125. Um, I don't know if that's true, but what I do know is true is that these days, many people are currently living in retirement longer than they worked. Um, I mean, I see people, you know, working for 30 years and retiring at 55 or 60, and they live to 90 or 95, which literally means for each year that you work, you need to meet your current living expenses, plus set aside enough so that it compounds to meet your expenses in the future. And so if we start with that as the nugget and we know that, you know, needs are going to include for some people things like you need to pay back your student loans, some people their needs are going to have to go up to 60% or more because of those debt obligations from student loans, which means there's not a lot left for wants unless you're willing to be a little more creative and flexible on other needs buying the three-year-old dealer certified used car, not a brand new car, Um, renting and having slightly smaller space than you would like to have. And so I think if you live your life aiming for the 50, 30, 20 rule, knowing very few people are gonna hit it exactly, but if you aim for that, or at least have an understanding of the thought process behind it, that can really help you prioritize all of these competing demands. Saving regularly is the real key to financial well-being, and you've alluded to that during this conversation, but it's a hard sell in an era in which looking good on social media might be a preoccupation for many young people. So the question is, is there a way to make the save more and live within your means message sexy? So I pray that some economics student does their PhD on comparing the cost of what it would take in real life to live and groom like the images we see in all forms of media, social media, TV, movies. Um, I have a bizarre obsession with the UK royal family. I think it, I spent a, a year abroad when I was in college at Oxford, and ever since then, I'm an Anglophile. So I will point to Meghan Markle's TV show, uh, Before She Got Married, Suits. That show takes place in a town that is exceptionally humid, yet every woman who works in her law office from the senior partners down to the paralegals down to the executive assistants have completely frizz-free hair, which means they have to get a blowout before going to the office at 8 a.m. in the morning. And their nails are always perfect. And, you know, we're all on computers all day, which means they're getting mani pedis a couple times a week. And then their clothes, if you look at like the way they're cut and the fit and the fabric, and then you see the homes they live in and the cars they drive. I 
suspect you'd have to earn 20 to 30 percent more than those jobs actually pay. And this goes for anything. I mean, go look at Law and Order or, you know, CSI, uh, pick any show you want, um, Grey's Anatomy, um, Scandal. They all have these outsized images of lifestyles relative to what those jobs pay in real life. And of course, social media doesn't make it any better, right? I mean, you see somebody's photo from vacation and you don't see the kids having a food fight and mom and dad giving each other the silent treatment. You just see the kumbaya photo at the end. And so we are constantly bombarded by what I call funny mirror images. And what I'd like is for somebody to blast that You know, when I was in college in the late 80s, early 90s, magazines were very reticent to say that they airbrushed photos. And so we were all comparing ourselves to cellulite-free, super skinny, size zero women, which we may still be doing. But at least we all know that photos get airbrushed. And so that's the message that I would like to get out there. We live in a world of funny mirror images. We recently interviewed Teresa Ghiarducci, an economist for the podcast, and she brought up the issue of what she called financial shame, that so many people conflate their self-worth with their net worths. You've alluded to some of the forces driving that, but how do you go about making people feel better and more empowered, even if they have a low or negative net worth? So I think this issue is ginormous. Um, Every time I bring up just the two words, financial shame, people like almost light up like, who? yeah, yeah, I got that. Um, And I think it's endemic. It's also the subject of my next book. And I'm, to be honest, struggling to find an answer. I think it's going to end up being a financial memoir rather than a how-to book because I still struggle with that. And I think that the one thing that I can say is that I have observed that we have been almost hardwired by society, by cultural norms, to try and optimize our lives for the equation self-worth equals net worth. And for many of us, that's a financial equation, you know, but then I've noticed in the fitness industry, there's a similar kind of, you know, self-worth equals body fat levels, you know, the leaner you are, the more you're, so, I mean, it can vary from different areas of interest, but I think for many people, it is financial. And what I'd like people who are struggling to know is it's so easy to think, if I just had more money, I would not feel this way. And what I've observed is it doesn't matter if you are $100,000 in debt or you make $1,100,000 a year, um, you can still feel that your self-worth equals your net worth and your net worth is too low. Um, And that's just human nature. And I think my early thoughts on all of this is that the answer is that we need as a society to shift it up and basically say financial health is what we'd like everyone in America to have, the basics of financial education and financial literacy so people aren't in financially painful situations. And and that involves, of course, a whole bunch of other things, living wages, et cetera. But financial health being the focus, not accumulating as much wealth as possible. So financial health plus emotional wealth and human connection and giving back to the collective community. I think we've lost so much of that. And I think we'd all be a lot richer for shifting paradigms. But I'm still working on it for myself. So I'll let you know how that test goes. What's your take on the fire movement? Do you think it's a healthy trend with staying power or more of a bull market phenomenon, given that investment balances are so high right now? So I have a total girl crush on Vicki Robin, who wrote um, Your Money or Your Life with Joe Dominguez back when. And, um, you know, 
came out in 92 and it was re-released and updated in 2018. And I had a chance to interview Vicky and um, it was really interesting talking to her. First, let me back up and say, I read the book um, in 92, 93, and it is the book that had the single biggest influence on my financial life. And primarily the concept that most of us have money in our lives because either we or someone near and dear to us spent time working for it. And thus, when we spend our money, we are spending our time. And the purpose of thinking about your money or your life is making sure that you are optimizing your life's energy when you spend your money. And it was part of the voluntary simplicity movement when the book first came out. Starting in 2018, and even a little bit before that, we had all kinds of Reddit subgroups, and now there are conferences devoted to the FIRE movement. And, you know, I'm all for financial independence, retire early. I myself have entered what I, I would prefer to call uh, vocational freedom rather than retire early. But the thing that I'm missing from the current execution of the movement is A, it feels like it's become really competitive. B, it feels like it's not honoring the original principles of connection to something bigger than ourselves, which is what Vicki and Joe intended it to be. And I feel like it's also lacking an emphasis on what comes after that. I mean, so you do it. Great. You know, you may have another 50 years after that. And how are you going to use it? And what are you going to do? And I'm not hearing that as part of, of the dialogue. It just feels like the biggest loser, you know, in terms of like a TV show and a race and not something that is part of a larger, more mindful, conscious discussion. I'm sure I'll get a whole bunch of hate emails from <laughs> folks in the FIRE movement. I, I do want to emphasize that I think the underlying principles of it are great. The way it's just being manifested today, I think, is at odds with the original intention of the concept. I wanted to spend a little bit of time on financial planning for couples. You co-wrote a book about how couples can find compatibility in their financial lives. When is the right time in a relationship to start talking about financial matters and what's the right way to go about it? Um, well, I'd say the right time is before you get divorced <laughs> because it, um, I wrote this book, um, co-wrote it while I was getting divorced. So once again, it, it's a book based on hard earned lessons. But my thought process has been, you know, when you meet someone, you are asked, are you physically compatible? Are you spiritually compatible? Are you intellectually compatible? Nobody asks you if you're financially compatible. And so I encourage people when you think there's something serious going on that could lead to you moving in together or possibly heading towards marriage, that is the time where you need to start opening up the financial kimono. I feel like having an understanding of where each other stand, at least in terms of net worth in the beginning, in terms of do you have a bunch of debt or not, is a great place to start. I think sharing uh, credit scores can also be a great place to start. You know, you may feel a little awkward about income in the beginning, but I think talking about where you are in terms of savings, your attitude towards it, where you're doing it, how, you know, you're saving your 401k and how you chose your investment selections or your 403b. So I feel like start with some of the hopefully more positive parts or the parts that can really impact where the relationship is going. Now, you don't have to jump right into that. You can start off with a gentler conversation about how, you know, the American Psychological Association will give you all the data year after year. Money is one of the top causes of fights and um, in relationships and top causes of divorce. And you can say, I want to invest in our relationship. I, I don't want us to end up like these statistics. So let's start talking about it. And you know, let's start with talking about 
where we each learned about money and, you know, what we think our best money move has been. So you can start, you know, what was the best piece of financial advice you've ever received? You can start with these positive conversations and then move into some of the the tougher ones that I spoke about. And I want to say it's not a one and done conversation either. And that's why I think it can really ruin marriages. Um, You know, in my case, I did have the conversations early on, but then things really evolved and got really busy. And, you know, you're you're doing well, your careers are going and um, you can easily realize that you didn't reset expectations as circumstances changed. I wanted to ask about that. If one partner in a relationship is financially healthy and the other is not, is there ever a successful resolution where the couple essentially adopts the good habits of the financially well person? Oh, frequently. I mean, there's so many ways that this can be, I call it the financial three-way. I mean, you can have it as, you know, the three buckets, yours, mine, and ours. And some couples feel strongly that everything goes in an hours bucket. And, you know, if you come together, your debt is my debt. And, you know, that's our decision. Other couples will say, no, what we come into it is yours and mine. And what is ours is only the moves that we make going forward. And these are the agreements we make. For instance, neither of us spends a hundred dollars, more than a hundred dollars without checking with the other. But at the same time, each of us has, you know, $50 a month, you know, if you're just getting started that you can spend no questions asked. So you can come up with whatever rules you, you, you need to. And, you know, as your income goes up, add a couple of zeros to those numbers, but it's definitely not a romance killer or a relationship killer. If you're wildly different. In fact, I wish I could think of the study, but um, somewhere I read, and again, not fact checked, that in the early stages of courting, there is something intoxicating about financial otherness. And so, you know, oftentimes that's why savers and spenders attract. But, you know, the long term studies show that shared values around finances are what keep couples together long term. And so use the financial three way, yours, mine and ours to figure out how you want to populate those buckets. I wanted to talk about financial advice and finding a financial advisor. How would you counsel people who don't have a lot of assets to find a good quality financial advisor? Where should someone look and what business models would tend to be most appropriate? So this has always been a big gaping hole in the industry prior to the last, let's call it 10 years, because you know, a lot of advisors have 500000 or a million dollar minimum or more. And, you know, how do you get to those levels when, you know, you don't have an advisor? And, you know, from the advisor standpoint, when I had my own practice, I had a $3 million minimum because as a boutique practice, that's what made economically the most sense for me. And so it's not like advisors are doing this because they're trying to be exclusionary. It's that the economics push them in this direction. And now technology is giving people a way to come back in the other direction. Of course, the earliest manifestation of this was the so-called robo-advisors. And I hate that term because it it sounds derogatory and they are wonderful offerings, you know, whether it's it's, um, Betterment or or Elevest. And I think what each of those firms have found is what we started off talking about. It's not just the investing. Good financial health when you're getting started and you have limited funds is about much more. And so what I'm seeing are two sets of, well, let me backtrack. So up until that point, the advice that I gave was go to Garrett Planning Network, which I still wholeheartedly support find an hourly CFP and work with them. You won't need that many hours when you're young because you don't have that many problems. But the problem is CFPs only have so many hours in the week, so it's not scalable. So a lot of the really great ones have waiting lists. So what I have been really encouraged by is seeing some of these so-called robo-advisors adding on additional services so that you can access financial advice and guidance on an a la carte basis. 
I'm also seeing firms develop kind of white labels. Um, one example would be open plan where you are getting the subsidiary, if you will, of a larger traditional wealth manager that offers what I would call a mass customized offering. In other words, there's a set of pieces of the investment plan that are walked through with each client based on their needs, but you're not going off the reservation. Um, So there's kind of a set price. And then if you need ongoing, it can either be a la carte or handed off to an estate lawyer, handed off to an accountant. And so I just encourage people to take a look at some of these larger organizations and then also see in their local areas, if you Google fiduciary, low minimum or fiduciary financial planning, oftentimes those keywords can help you find someone in your area. And of course, with technology, and again, going back to the beginning, thanks to the pandemic, now many of us are so comfortable having an advisor somewhere else where we wouldn't have been in the past. So places, you know, like the XY Planning Network that will have younger advisors, but advisors who are completely capable with helping other younger folks deal with the, you know, the level of complexity is matching their experience and the customer need. You're a certified financial planner and a chartered financial analyst. For people listening who might be considering a career in the financial industry, how can they figure out which designation is the right one for them if they decide to pursue either? What sort of questions should they be asking themselves? To me, it all boils down to investing versus planning. If you are going to be an investor with a capital I, and I I don't mean doing asset allocation or helping clients construct a portfolio from um, perhaps, you know, a short list if you're an RIA working under a larger umbrella with a communal investment policy committee that you can rely on. When I'm saying investor, what I mean is somebody who is actively acting as a buy side analyst or acting as what I'll call an old school portfolio manager and really getting into the nitty gritty of either fundamental analysis or quantitative analysis. And ironically, in the first half of my career, when I was a CFA, I had no, I mean, I literally had no conception of all of the other elements that went into financial planning. And when I shifted sides, I thought, oh, I mean, I just felt embarrassed and horrified by my lack of broader understanding of how many more issues. And so, you know, if the kinds of things you want to help people with, and in in some sense, I'd say it's internal and external, right? So being a Investor large is often about creating the product um, or the investment vehicle. And wearing the CFP hat is almost more external in terms of helping individuals figure out the big questions. Um, How much do I need to save for retirement? How much can I spend in retirement? How do I set up my legacy planning? How do we minimize taxes using, you know, tax loss harvesting or um, other charitable giving techniques? And what I've learned from being on the capital I side is that, you know, so often large institutional money management firms have clients that come to them because the client either internally with an internal CIO or CFO or with the help of an external institutional consultant has set their asset allocation and is talking to this particular manager or giving this particular fund their assets because they have the big picture sorted out from another construct. Whereas on the individual side, it is the CFP oftentimes who is acting in a sense like the institutional consultant or the CFO of a client's life. I want to delve into a personal question, which you've been generous enough to say you're okay with my asking. Naomi Osaka made headlines recently when she withdrew from the French Open. She cited issues with depression and anxiety and noted that she wanted to concentrate on taking care of herself. 
you've been very public about having bipolar disorder and getting treatment for it. Do you think we're finally ready to discuss and destigmatize the mental health challenges that many among us are dealing with? Oh, gosh, I really, really hope so, Christine, because the more I talk about it, I mean, I cannot tell you there's not a single time that I bring it up where somebody doesn't express having had some kind of interaction with a mental health issue. It may not be themselves. It may be a friend. It may be a parent. It may be a spouse or a sibling. And yet there's two types of mental health issues. One is situational and one is chemical and chemical ones can be um, triggered um, or exacerbated by situational circumstances. And in my case, it's chemical. You don't end up with bipolar simply because um, there's a situation, although that can help a psychiatrist appropriately diagnose. Part of the reason I think it's so important to talk about it is to encourage people to seek help if it's situational, a psychologist may be the right answer. If it's chemical, a psychiatrist may be the right answer. It may be a combination of both. There are a lot of wonderful new therapies, whether it's, you know, tapping or EMDR on more of the situational side or atypical antipsychotics on the chemical side. But the root issue is that you can't get better if you don't seek help. And as long as we treat people like they, you know, have three noses coming out of their face when they talk about this topic, they're not going to go seek help. And even once you do seek help, it's not an immediate solution. It takes time to work through a situational series of depression or anxiety or PTSD. And on the chemical side, one of the problems is you can't just take a blood test. Um, for years, I was diagnosed as having a major depressive disorder. And so I took meds for major depressive disorder. And that was not my problem. And until you get the right diagnosis, which again, cannot be done by a blood test, it's difficult to get the right medicines. And even when you get the right diagnosis, we have individual chemistry. And so the way doctors prescribe medicine is through trial and error. And, you know, in the case of bipolar, you often have to take two, three, four different types of medicines. And you think about it as a cocktail and you have to play around not only with what those medicines are, but the dosage. And so it's an elaborate process, no matter which side, what's causing the mental anguish. And when you have to hide it, Oh my God, it's, I mean, it's like, how can you go through all of the other stuff if you have to pretend that nothing is happening to you? You know, and it's scary, right? I mean, I'll be honest, when I had my own practice, I did not feel comfortable putting up a neon sign saying, you know, I have bipolar. Um, I did talk honestly with clients about having periods where I felt depressed or a bit anxious, and sometimes we bond on that. But I mean, I can see in certain industries where people might feel reticent speaking about it, but when you get the right help, you know, now that I've been appropriately diagnosed, I live a normal life. And so that's why I want to talk about it and normalize it, encourage people to get help, because with help, you really can lead a normal life. Well, Manisha, you have been so thoughtful and so generous with your time and insights today. Thanks so much for taking time out of your schedule to be here. We really appreciate it. Well, Christine and Jeff, it has been such an honor. Take care. Well, thanks so much. The pleasure was ours. Thanks again. Thanks for joining us on The Long View. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe to and rate The Long View from Morningstar on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Christine underscore Benz. And at S-Youth1, which is S-Y-O-U-T-H and the number one. George Cassidy is our engineer for the podcast, and Carrie Gretchik produces the show notes each week. Finally, we'd love to get your feedback. If you have a comment or a guest idea, please email us at thelongview at morningstar.com. Until next time, thanks for joining us.
This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar Inc. and its affiliates. Morningstar and its affiliates are not affiliated with this guest or his or her business affiliates unless otherwise stated. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. Jeff Patak is an employee of Morningstar Research Services, LLC. Morningstar Research Services is a subsidiary of Morningstar Inc. and is registered with and governed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analyses, or opinions, or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decision.